Hello everyone. Today we will discuss, management of acute pulmonary edema. Acute pulmonary edema is one of the most common causes of unscheduled hospital admissions among patients 65 years old or older. In hospital mortality ranges from 4 to 10 percent. The readmission rate ranges from 15 percent at one month to 45 to 50 percent at six months. One in three patients dies within one year. Acute pulmonary edema is usually defined by the sudden increase in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure as a result of acute and fulminant left ventricle, LV, systolic and or diastolic, failure or acute severe mitral regurgitation. Alveolar edema is generated by a rapid increase in the hydrostatic pressure in the pulmonary capillaries and has a low protein concentration compared to plasma. Verghese and his colleagues reported an impairment alveolar epithelial barrier in 25% of patients. The resultant is hypoxia which triggers a cascade sequence of inter-organ crosstalk, including lungs and kidneys, but also liver, intestine, brain, neuroendocrine and vascular system. Congestion is an essential pathophysiological mechanism leading to organ dysfunction. Patient presents with acute respiratory distress. Features are Dyspnea with orthopnea, tachynea, RR greater than 25 per minute, increased work of breathing, hypoxia, jugular vein distension, bilateral crackles on chest auscultation. In initial management do a 12-lead ECG to exclude acute coronary syndrome. Then do blood gases and lactate. Finish this assessment within 15 minutes. If hospital admission is decided then send, laboratory tests including troponins, creatinine, urea, electrolytes, liver function tests, and blood glucose. Do a chest x-ray, lung ultrasound, and send natriuretic peptide testing. If plasma natriuretic peptide values are less, then we can rule out cardiac origin for the hypoxia. It has good negative predictive value. At times acute pulmonary edema can exist with ARDS. The goals of management are to improve oxygenation, maintain an adequate blood pressure and reduce excess extracellular fluid, whilst addressing the underlying cause. Due to the challenges of undertaking high-quality research in the field, many recommendations that underline management decisions are largely based on expert consensus rather than robust evidence. Pulmonary edema increases up to 20-fold the work of breathing and oxygen consumption. This major physiological stress on the heart can be partially relieved by non-invasive ventilation, either continuous positive airway pressure, CPAP, or pressure support ventilation with positive end expiratory pressure, which improves oxygenation and ventilation. NIV decreases cardiac preload and LV afterload, increases right ventricule afterload and finally facilitates cardiac function. Intravenous loop diuretics are used to achieve decongestion as the cornerstone of therapy. They act as immediate venodilator and subsequent diuretic agent. High diuretic doses may cause greater neurohormonal activation, electrolyte abnormalities and are associated with poorer outcomes. It may be appropriate to start IV diuretic treatment using low doses and to assess the diuretic response, hourly urine output and urine sodium content. If there is an insufficient diuretic response, the loop diuretic dose can be increased, followed by concomitant administration of thiazides. IV vasodilators, nitrates or nitroprusside, dilate venous and arterial vessels to a variable extent, leading to a reduction in venous return, less congestion, lower afterload and consequent relief of symptoms. Vasodilators should be used cautiously in normotensive patients with the risk of hypotension. How to avoid readmission. Persistent congestion before discharge is associated with a higher risk of readmission and mortality. Once respiratory and hemodynamic stabilization is achieved, treatment should be optimized before discharge. Treatment optimization has three major aims, to relieve congestion, to treat comorbidities and to initiate or restart oral medications. ACE inhibitors should be addressed in LV systolic and diastolic dysfunction. Beta blockers are potentially dangerous if used acutely when the patient is unstable but should be restarted in patients already on beta blockers. Thank you.